So this morning we have the great privilege of having some close friends of Rachel and I uh, all the way from Ann Arbor, uh, Radiant Church in Ann Arbor. We have Pastor Jeremy and Anna Brown with us today. And in a moment I'm going to have Pastor Jeremy come up here. I just, just wanted to quickly say it, it really is a privilege. Uh, first service was an incredible message. And, um, but even beyond that, uh, Pastor Jeremy and Anna have been uh, uh, faithful friends to Rachel and I. We, uh, we spent several years together in Radiant Church Kalamazoo working on staff in different departments, but just living life. And uh, I will say this, uh, he has far more stories about me that I do not want you to ever hear than I would prefer. And uh, I've already told our sound guy that if he starts going anywhere near those stories, he's to mute the microphone. I would like to remind Pastor Jeremy that if you take me down, I will take you down. So, <laughs> no, uh, he's a phenomenal time. He's such a funny guy, and even beyond that, their leadership uh, has year over year have proven themselves as leaders, uh, not just as a, at a radiant church, but really the culture that they have created in the midst of a, a, an environment that really uh, is, is not as passionately on fire for God as one would hope. They have created a... Uh, a center in the middle of it with their church that truly values and runs after the heart of God through prayer. They have prioritized it, and their church is a praying church. And we are too, but I, I really see them as being even many years down the road from where I want to go and as an inspiration for us and how we one day can, can get there within the expression of our own church. And so I really look to, to them for their wisdom, for their encouragement, and uh, just the things that they have done to get to get their church there. So I'm very thankful that they're with us today. We've had a great time since they've been up here. And uh, so Radiant Church, can you give a big welcome to Pastor Jeremy Brown. Well, thank you, Jerry and Rachel. It's such an honor for us to be here. Uh, we're really excited to be able to be here with you this morning. Uh, like Jerry said, we have been friends for a while. We were on staff together, and so we know lots of things about each other. And there's a lot of things that you all know just because Jerry is your pastor. Uh, one of the things you know about him is that he is the hardest working human being you will ever meet. Everybody's shaking their head. Yeah. I don't know how he gets so much stuff done, but he just does. I'm still thinking about what I want to do, and he's completed what he set out to do. He is an incredibly hardworking individual. Uh, you know that he loves Jesus, and he is committed to the local church. That's one of the things that you know about Pastor Jerry beyond a shadow of a doubt, and he and Rachel have, have laid their lives down as long as I've known him, since he was, gosh, you're not that old already, like probably since he was eight, he's been serving in the church, running video, doing all of that kind of stuff. He has spent his life serving in the local church and making a place where people can encounter the presence of God and have their life forever changed by him. And so you know that about Jerry. But maybe one of the things that you don't know about him and that I just learned for myself this weekend is that he is the most incredible and honoring host uh, that I have ever encountered. Is that he treated me like I was Stephen Furtick and Billy Graham rolled into one. <laughs> like coming up into this town. I'm Jeremy Brown from Ann Arbor. Nobody's ever heard of me. My kids don't think I'm special. But I come here and Jerry is like, he's got the itinerary for all of the restaurants. He's got the tree. He took me to the jewel that is Ludington State Park. I'd never been there before. And he drove me around and showed me where the different trails start. He gave recommendations for which trails we should do based on what I looked like fitness-wise I could do. So is this that Hidden Lakes Trail, which I'm assuming is the hardest one there, not the easiest. And uh, we just had a great time spending time with him. He's picking us up at our hotel, driving us around. Just the most incredible and honoring uh, man and friend. And so, Pastor Jerry, thank you so much for that. We love you and Rachel. And, you know, I lead a church. But if I wasn't leading a church, if that wasn't what God had asked me to do, I'd want to be a part of a church like this and serving under people like you because you're passionate for Jesus. You're all in with what you're doing. You're so honoring. It's such a healthy culture that has been created there. This is, you are, are lucky to be a part of this. And this is why I say to some of you who have aspirations of leading at higher levels in church someday, uh, here's my tip for you. Uh, get involved in a healthy church like you are at right here. The reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because I used to be the guitar player. I used to be the guy that was over here playing guitar, and that was what I did. But I was faithful in that. I was committed to the vision of the house, supported it, served under it, honored my leaders, and God just used that to then take me to the place of where I'm doing what I'm doing now. So you are in a fertile ground for leadership, development, discipleship. Uh, dig in and take advantage of that because it's not like that at every church. 
Now, Anna and I, we started Radiant Church in Ann Arbor. We're going to have our seven-year anniversary in September, which we're really excited about. And uh, it's really, yeah, I am excited. I, I had a lot more hair back then, and I didn't have kids. So, like, kids and starting a church, and it's been going fast. I look at Jerry, and that's one of the things I look at. That hairline is incredible. I am <laughs> envious of that. Uh, that's neither here nor there. That was free for all of you. But when we started the church, it's actually about eight years ago when the Lord spoke to us about starting a church in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so we went to the conferences, we bought the books, you know, we got the plan together of what we were going to do, but we figured out we didn't really know what we were doing and we had no confidence in it. But for a year before we started the church, um, when I was on staff at a church in Kalamazoo, there were seven people that I conned into moving to Ann Arbor with me to be a part of the launch team. I lied. I said, Ann Arbor, Michigan is 75 and sunny year-round. It's amazing. You're going to love it. No, don't go visit. Don't check the weather. Just trust me. <laughs> like, and so we got seven people to commit to moving to Ann Arbor and being a part of the church plant. And we started getting together for uh, every Tuesday night. For a year before we moved, every Tuesday night for three hours, we got together in the upper room there, and we just prayed and we worshiped. The seven of us, we had our iPods back then, so we had the playlist that was going, and back then it was all Hillsong all the time. So we had our, our Hillsong songs, and we're just worshiping, and we're crying out to God and asking him to go before us. We're asking him to do a move. We're asking him to make it so we're not so scared. Like I mean, we were terrified. We had no idea what we were doing, but we had this big whiteboard, and we'd just go up there, and we'd listen to what God was speaking to us, and we'd just start writing down the things and the people groups and the different things that he was going to be doing. And just week after week, we'd gather for three hours, and we'd pray, we'd seek the face of God, and we'd cry, and we'd enjoy his presence. And, and then after that, we would go to Wendy's, and we would get Frosties. So it was a great time, but for an entire year, that was all we did as a church plant. We just got together, and we just prayed. We worshiped. We listened to what it was that God was saying to us and what it was that he wanted to do. And then we moved to Ann Arbor and, and all the, the seven people that came along with us, they didn't have jobs. And so they just came over to our house every night and we'd make them dinner. And so we would pray and we would worship and we would eat together. And that's how the church started. And those are the three best things in life. Praying, worshiping, and eating together are awesome. And that's how our church was birthed, and more people were gathering until we got to the point of where we had our first Sunday morning service. And ever since then, we've just continued to go after God, just praying and worshiping and eating together, and we have prospered in every one of those areas. And it, now, as a church, what we've done is we've moved into the place of where it's gone from just the few of us that were gathering together on Sunday mornings or even just the few of us that were gathering together uh, in the upper room in Kalamazoo and then in my house to now we're a church of where we are about praying. That's what we are about. So right now we're doing our summer of prayer. We have a one-hour prayer and intercession meeting every Sunday morning. About a third to a half of our church attends. Like getting a half of your church to a prayer meeting before church, like thank you Jesus, something is happening. We have three daily prayer meetings going on at 6.30 a.m. We have usually 10, 12 people, 6.30 a.m. are showing up at church to pray. Like, that's incredible. And then we have a noon prayer meeting, a 6.30 p.m. prayer meeting. People are gathering. We're just worshiping Jesus. We're interceding and asking God to do something inside of our hearts, inside of our church, and inside of our city. And he's answering those prayers. So if you had told me, Years and years ago, because I, you know, I grew up a little choir boy, bell, not bellhop, what are they called? The acolyte. <laughs> That's, you could tell I was real good at my job when I thought I was a bellhop and I was trying to put out the candles. So <laughs> I was an acolyte choir boy growing up in a little mainline denominational church. And if you told me back then that someday I would pastor a church and our passion and our heartbeat would be praying and having prayer meetings three times a day and I'd be leading meetings at 6.30 in the morning to pray... I'd be like, no, thank you. Like, I'm going to join Jonah. We're getting on the boat. We're going to Nineveh. Like, we are out of here. I am not doing that. That's a worst case scenario. God sent me to Africa, Southeast Asia, like wherever. Do not make me have to just pray all the time. And maybe some of you are feeling like that. You're like, oh, I would never want to be a part of that church. That sounds like the worst case scenario for what a church could be, just praying all the time. But we are passionate about it now, and the reason for that is because I, I began to grow in my understanding of what prayer really is. As a kid, I remember the first prayer that I learned was that, like, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. 
You know what that taught me? I had to be scared of dying every single night. I'm four years old. I never thought about the fact that I could die. And first of all, I thought it was about my sister. My sister's name was Amy, so I thought it was now lie Amy, my baby sister, down to sleep. And I was like, Jesus, don't take her soul tonight. Like, whatever you do, I'll be good. I'll listen to mom and dad. Just don't take my sister. So I was freaked out by that. And then as I got a little bit older, I thought that prayer was just asking God for stuff. And I'd read about these people that did incredible things for the Lord. And one of the consistent things that you saw in every one of their life is they had a strong prayer life. I grew up Methodist, so John Wesley, looking at him, he would pray three hours on his knees every single morning. Yay, like sign me up. No, like <laughs> horrible. And, but I knew that God was doing something through prayer, so I started saying, God, I'm going to like wake up and I'm going to pray. You know, I'm probably 12 at this point. I'm like, all right, I'm going to make my prayer list because I heard people talk about your prayer list. So I'm writing down every relative I know. I'm writing down every situation I'm aware of that's going on in the world. And so I'm praying. I got my list out, and I'm praying through it in the morning. I'm like, God bless my Aunt Melissa and my Uncle Dave and my cousins Brad. And, and you know, I'm just like praying through every person. And my sister, Jesus, thank you that you didn't take Amy's soul yet. And you know, going through the whole list of things. And then I'm praying for world peace and an end to AIDS and whatever else. And then I'm like, all right, got to be getting close to three hours. A minute and a half has passed. I have prayed for everything I can think of in a minute and a half. And then I realized I needed to just start thanking God for things. God, thank you for my life. Thank you so much that you're good. God, thank you for three square meals a day. Thank you that the grass is green. Thank you for dolphins. Like, I'm just... Anything I can think of, just insincere gratitude, just trying to fill up time. And I never got anywhere close to probably a half hour in all of that. And I was like, prayer is lame. It's so boring, but it's a discipline. And like eating vegetables and running, you have to discipline yourself to do these things that are just really unenjoyable and you trust that there's going to be some benefit to it. So that was my idea of prayer. And you can see why I didn't get very excited about prayer. Then the Lord did something inside of my heart. And I began to realize that I had been wrong about prayer my whole life. That the drudgery and the discipline that prayer had been for me was because I didn't understand what prayer was. See, prayer isn't asking God for things. Prayer is an insincere gratitude trying to fill time. Prayer isn't rote memorization of you know, ritualistic prayers that we're praying. That's not what prayer is. What God began to reveal to me was that prayer is really relating to him. At the heart of what prayer is, it's us relating to God. I want you to understand this. You're familiar with the Genesis story. It says that God creates Adam and Eve. The world's perfect. They're perfect. It says that God comes and he walks with them in the cool of the evening. This is a part of their daily routine. How awesome is that? You're living in Eden You're married, you've never had a fight with your spouse because you're both perfect. We can't even imagine that. And God comes and he takes a walk with you every evening. You know what that is? That's prayer. They were relating to God. They were walking with God. They were having conversations with God. They were enjoying the presence of God. That became the model for what prayer is and my understanding of prayer is. It's going back to that place of perfect and unbroken relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now, that's exciting to me. That's something that I want more of. That's something that probably all of you wish that you were closer to God, that there was more intimacy, more passion in your relationship with him, but you didn't understand how it is that you get to that point. We think it's, well, I have to do this, or I have to serve more, I have to give more, I have to wear the Christian t-shirts and the bumper stickers or whatever else. It has nothing to do with that. What's going to create intimacy in your relationship with God is that you're going to begin relating to him. And that's what prayer is. So this is what we do when we pray, and this is what most of my prayer time is. is uh, it's praise and adoration. When you were in here, if you were engaging in worship this morning, and you were going after it, and you were like singing from your heart, like, all hail King Jesus, or, or God, you're worthy of it all, what you were doing was you were praying. You were adoring Jesus. It says that when we enter into the temple, this, this model for what prayer and worship and relating to God looks like that we see through the temple, it says that we enter into the, through the gates of thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That the first way that we approach the presence of God is through adoring him. 
It's like my relationship with my wife. If I wanted to relate to her, if I wanted to build relationship and intimacy with her, what I do is I adore her. I praise her. I celebrate her. The reason why we have a relationship isn't because I saw her, thought that she looked very attractive, and said, hey, uh, my name's Jeremy, and here's a list of the things that I need. I need a wife that is loving and supportive, and I need some navel oranges from Costco. Like, that's not going to build relationship with her. She's like, creeper, get away. Like, don't ever talk to me again. What I do is I'm like, hey, baby, you're so beautiful. Bat my eyes. <laughs> It works somehow. But I'm, I'm like, oh, you're incredible. Anna, I love you. My heart is for you. you like, that's, that's building relationship with her. I'm adoring her. That can, that's what built my relationship with her and convinced her to marry me. Like, thank you, Jesus. It's what continues to build my relationship. You take adoration and praise out of any relationship and just the list of here's what I need you to do for me, that relationship is going to tank but in your marriage, even with your friendships or whatever, if you, or your children or your parents, if you start adding adoration, praise, and celebration into that relationship and the way that you relate to them, I guess it's going to skyrocket. That builds love. That builds relationship and intimacy. So that's what we need to do with God. And let me tell you, there is no one who's more worthy of adoration. It is easy to love Jesus because he's only ever been good. He's only ever been faithful. He's never let us down. He's never wronged us. He gave his life for us. It's easy to adore Jesus. And so when I'm praying, probably 90% of my prayer time, and this is what I figured out, these people that are praying three hours, they're just spending a lot of time adoring, praising, and worshiping Jesus. So most of my prayer time is just celebrating who he is. What an incredible time we live in. I, I saw you guys have the, the Spotify list for all of the songs that you guys are going to be doing every Sunday. You want to start developing a, a prayer time and relating to Jesus? Cheat. Just take those songs. You don't need a band. You don't need Pastor Nate in your living room, you know, serenading you with keys and leading you in worship. You got Spotify. You got YouTube. You got iTunes. Create playlist and then let other people lead you in worship because it's not important who's on the stage. It's important who's on the throne. That's what leads us to adore and to worship. So you want to pray and relate to God? Adore him. Celebrate him. Worship him. And then the other thing I do a lot when I'm praying is, and relating to him is I just enjoy his presence. Anna and I drove 38 hours or whatever it is to get from Ann Arbor to Ludington. And for part of that time, it was adoring her and celebrating her. Part of that time was talking about, you know, how do we get the yogurt off of everything in our house because our kids just, like, get it everywhere. Those of you that are parents, you understand. But then part of it was just silence. But it was good because my wife was there with me. I love just being with Anna. It is good to be with Anna, even when we're not saying anything to each other. The truth is, when we first started dating, I felt a lot of pressure to always be talking, and so I make little like cue cards, little note cards, and we're talking on the phone so I wouldn't run out of material, like stories from my childhood, you know, clever observations, anecdotes, questions to ask her, because I felt like I got to be talking, like I always got to be closing, make that deal. And what I discovered now is that the relationship has matured, and now we don't have to talk all the time. In fact, it's probably better that I don't talk all the time. It's easier for her to love me when I shut up. You know, it's the same way for us with God. You don't always have to be talking. You can just enjoy his presence. His presence is everywhere all the time, but when you set your heart and your attention on him, there's a magnification of his presence that occurs. You can encounter the presence of God in a real and life-changing way every time you set your heart towards him. That's praying. Just enjoying the presence of God is a part of what prayer is. So do that. Take some moments to be quiet and just enjoy the fact that God is there. So I do, like, I make my playlist, I'm worshiping, I'm adoring him for, you know, half hour, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, the time just flies by. But then I have some time where just the music's going, but I'm just enjoying him. My heart and my attention is on him. He's the honored guest in the room. I'm hosting him. I'm aware of his presence, but I don't have to say anything. I can just enjoy him because the relationship has matured. Part of what I do when I pray is it's communicating what's on my heart. Sometimes there's just things that are going on in your life. You have questions, there's things you don't understand, situations and circumstances. 
And instead of internalizing it, it's good just to communicate that to God. Now, why? It's not that God needs to know what's on our heart because he already knows. It's for our benefit. It's us beginning to process. And there's nobody better to process through things with than Jesus. He's a really good listener. He's really good at leading us. And then as we begin to communicate what's on our heart, he also begins to communicate what's on his heart. There's a lot of things that God has on his heart. There are a lot of things that God wants to speak to you. There's things that God wants to reveal to you. But we never create the opportunity for him to do that. It's either that we don't pray, we never take time to set aside for him, or it's that when we're praying, it's just the laundry list, the phone conversation of, hey, Anna, I need to pick up the blah, 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 the store, I'm doing great, here's what's on my heart, goodbye. And we never give a chance to actually listen to God and to what it is that he's going to speak to us. The most powerful and impactful moments in my life haven't been what some human said to me, and I've sat under some of the greatest teachers of the Bible in this world, some of the wisest people that you could ever meet. They've said great things that have been impactful, but the most powerful, life-changing things I've ever heard have come when I've been just listening to the voice of God, and he speaks to my heart. You know, God will speak to you. He wants to speak to you. You were designed to hear the voice of God. It's not that some people hear God and other people just can't. Jesus said, I am the shepherd and my sheep recognize my voice. So if you are one of the sheep, that means that you've been adopted into the family of God. You're one of his people. It means that you were built and designed and have the ability to recognize the voice of God speaking to you. That's a game changer. You can hear God speak to you. I'm so grateful that God has spoken to us through Scripture. I love Scripture. I believe every word of Scripture. I do the best to study Scripture, to gain more understanding in it, because God reveals so much of his nature, his character, his will, the narrative, and the arc of what it is that he's doing throughout humanity to redeem us. I love Scripture. But I'm also glad that God doesn't only speak through Scripture, but that he speaks to us personally and individually. Now, this is what I will say, because some people get a little weirded out by this. Uh, Everything that God's going to say to you, if he's saying it, is going to be backed up with Scripture. He's never going to contradict himself. He's not going to, you know, so this is what happens. I had people that come to me, and they're like, you know, God told me to leave my wife and to marry someone else. That's what God told me. And I'm like, that wasn't God. That was you, a demon or demon version of you. It was one of those options. But we know in Scripture, God says that he hates divorce, and he says let no one separate what he has joined together. So you just deciding to go follow after someone else and divorce your wife, that's not God speaking to you, and we know that because we have Scripture. So everything that God's speaking to you, back it up with Scripture. Because I don't know if you've ever noticed, are you ever good at sounding like God to yourself? Have you ever been fasting? And you feel God speak to you and release you to enjoy some chips and salsa before bed? That's you. (laughs) But we're good at sounding like the whole... Have you ever wanted to make a purchase for something? Oh, man, I need to buy... I'm in in a lake town. This is a bad example. I need to buy that lake house. Use it as a, a prayer and ministry center for the world. No, that's you. Like, you just want a lake house. We all want a lake house. I'm moving here. No. (laughs) The Lord called me to Ann Arbor, where it's always 75 and sunny. Yay! We have some water there. We have a creek about that wide that runs through our town, and we try to kayak in it, and it doesn't work. Uh, but everything God speaks to you will be backed up with Scripture. Listen to God. Allow him to speak to you individually about the situations and the circumstances that you're in. Allow him to speak to you about what his will is for you and direction for your life. It will change everything about you. And then there's this last piece, and it is petitioning God. It's asking God for things. And I said, I thought you said that prayer isn't just about asking God for things. You're right. It's not just about asking God for things, but a part of prayer and relating to him is that I do communicate to him what my needs are, and I ask him to meet those needs. We should be doing that with God. It's what he has asked us to do. And this is what it says in 1 John 5, 14 through 15 about petitioning him. It says, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked for. I want you to let that sink in. This is a life-changing word that Jesus himself is speaking to us. 
If we ask anything according to his will, we have a confidence in knowing that we are going to receive that thing that we have asked for. That should get you fired up to pray. That should get you jacked up to start asking God for his will. Now, it doesn't say anything you want. If it was that case, I would not be driving around a 2004 Toyota Sienna with 203,000 miles on it. I would be driving a yellow Lamborghini with the scissor doors, and it would be awesome. But it doesn't say we get whatever we want or whatever we ask for. There's some bad theology around that. It says that whatever we ask for according to his will, whatever it is according to what God has determined for you, whatever it is that's a part of God's plans and purposes for your life, when we ask for those things, it says that we can have a confidence in knowing that we are going to receive them. So what has God spoken to you? I did this little analogy in the first service because I always see it when I I watch you guys' live stream, which I must say, your tech team is incredible. Camera crew, lights, sound, video. I don't even know what all it is. It looks like a church of 70,000 by the quality of the video that is going on. And I know Jerry, he's doing the MacGyver thing. He probably had two cameras, $7, and a paper clip, and he made it all happen. But I, I watched the live stream, and it's just incredible. And uh, he's always doing these clever analogies. Like, I saw a couple weeks ago, he had a boat up on the stage or something. And I'm like, I got to, like, do something when I come here. And so I tried for a service, and it was terrible. So I'll just tell you what happened. <laughs> I asked Pastor Nate up onto the stage, because we don't know each other very well. We've seen each other a few times. He came up here, and I said, in this analogy, I'm God. Okay, it was good to feel like that for a second. Now I'll move on. In this analogy, I'm God, and my will is to give you $100. And he was like, all right. And that was it. And then we both stood there awkwardly, just looking at each other. And then I let him go take a seat because it was so, so awkward. But what I was doing is this is how we treat God. God says, this is my will for you. I want to do this. I want to do this in your marriage. I want to do this in your children. This is the business idea that I want to give you. This is the ministry idea I've given you. This is whatever it might be that God has spoken to you. He says, this is my will for your life. And we're like, yeah, like, thank you. That's exciting. And then we just stand there awkwardly. And then time passes, and it gets more awkward. And sometimes it's days, weeks, months, years, and we just stand there. And what I was saying was that I, I... told him, this is what I want to do for you, Nate, and he never even asked me for what it was that I said I wanted to do for him. Because this is human nature. It feels awkward for us to ask people for the things that they've even said they want to do for us. I said, I want to give you $100, and he doesn't even ask me for the $100. He just smiles and then looks awkward, like, what do I do? Why don't I have $100? Maybe he doesn't want to give me $100. Maybe I misheard him. Maybe he's just a jerk. Is he just trying to humiliate me in front of all my people? I don't like this guy. But that's why we naturally treat God. God speaks to you about what his will is for your life, and we just stand there, and we don't do anything. We don't ask for it. Or maybe we'll ask once or twice, and then God says no. We're like, what? I thought you said you wanted to do this. Why are you saying no? Or God, I, okay, you said you want to do this. When are you going to do it? I'm not hearing you speak anymore. Like, God, what's going on? Why is this happening? Jesus speaks to us and gives us a clue of what's happening and the response that we are supposed to have when he reveals his will to us. He says this, Luke 11, 5 through 10. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey, has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up to give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. Like if you have your Bible open, I didn't even tell you what we were looking at, so my apologies on that. But that's a good thing to circle, highlight, underline. Because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. 
Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, to the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What Jesus is saying is that when it comes to his will and what it is that he's spoken to you about what he wants to do for you, through you, in you, all of those types of things, he says to never give up. He says that you need to approach him with shameless audacity and continue to ask him, God, you said that you were going to do this, so God, I'm asking you to do it. God, you said that this is what was going to happen, so God, I'm asking you to do that thing. God, time's passing, but I'm not giving up. I'm going to keep knocking on that door. I'm going to keep seeking after you. I'm going to keep asking for this thing, and it doesn't matter how many days, how many months, how many years might pass. I'm going to have shameless audacity in petitioning you for the things that you have said that you are going to do for me, in me, and through me. Jesus, I'm not giving up. Now, a lot of times we think this is awkward, like we shouldn't do that. But this is exactly what God wants us to do. God is commanding us to be shamelessly audacious in petitioning him for his will to be done. Now, Pastor Nate, he didn't, you know, hound me for the $100 because we really don't know each other that well, and it'd be pretty weird. You know who will hound me until the day I die? My children. They will never stop petitioning me. I made a mistake three years ago. My son is seven, so he's four at the time. And he sees me using a chainsaw. And you can tell, like, I've done a lot of chainsawing. You know, I look like that kind of guy. (laughs) He's like, Dad, can I use the chainsaw? And I'm like, Eason, someday you will chainsaw. We will chainsaw together. I want you to be able to cut firewood, split wood with me, do all that kind of stuff. Someday you are going to do this. Can I do it today? No, you're four. Can I do it tomorrow? No, you still won't be able to do it. When will I be able to do it? I honestly don't know when you'll be able to do it, when you're ready for it. So the next day, Dad, can I use the chainsaw today? No, you're four in one day now. You still cannot use the chainsaw. Continues. I'm not kidding you. It is a common, every time he sees me with a chainsaw, it's been three years, Dad, you said you were going to let me use the chainsaw. I want to use the chainsaw, Dad. And I don't get mad at him. I'm not like, oh, gosh. I'm like, yes, someday you will use the chainsaw. But he hounds me. He's persistent. He will not give up until the day that he uses that chainsaw. That's how God wants you to be. God says, this is what I want for you. The problem is he doesn't give us the timeline. He just says, keep asking me. Now, why don't I let my son use the chainsaw now? Because I am a responsible father. I know that if he used the chainsaw now, he would kill me, himself, his sisters, any neighbors that we might have nearby us. Me giving him that blessing would be a blessing later in life would actually be destructive to him now. So I, in my wisdom, don't allow him to use that now. But he keeps asking me because he knows what my will is for him. And when the time is right, and I don't know when that time is going to be, he will use a chainsaw. There is a time for God's will in your life. It even says of Jesus, you know, when God, going back to Genesis 3, God says, you guys ruined everything, you sinned, all of that stuff, I got to kick you out of the garden, but here's the promise, is that someday a redeemer is going to come who's going to trample the works of the enemy and is going to redeem you. You know how much time passed between when God said that that was his will for humanity and when Jesus rose from the grave? That was a long time. But you know what it says about the timing? It says at just the right time. When we were still lost in our trespasses, Jesus died for us. When did Jesus do it? At just the right time. We don't know the timeline for God's will in our life, unless he's spoken that to you, in which case you should be up here preaching instead of me, because I don't get those kinds of words. (laughs) But you know what it is that he's spoken to you. Will you be shamelessly audacious in seeking after God for it? Because the only thing that will keep you from the fullness of everything that God's spoken is your own faithfulness. God's always faithful. But too many times we become faithless and we give up on asking God and petitioning God for the things that he's spoken, the will that he's revealed to us. I love the story of Elijah. This is the real world example of it. This isn't just teaching. This is someone who lived it out. Elijah's living in a cave for three years. There's drought in the land. After three years, God tells him, I'm about to bring rain. 
go and tell the king. So he goes and tells the king, who, by the way, hates him and wants to kill him, that good news, God's going to bring rain. And then he goes and he prays, God, send the rain. You know what happens? First of all, it wasn't Elijah's idea. Elijah was like, you know what? This seems like a good time to stop the drought. I'm going to start praying for that. It's God says, I'm going to send rain. You go and tell the king. So he's obedient. He's faithful. All right, I'm going to go tell the king, and I believe that God's going to send the rain. So God send the rain. He prays. Nothing. Sends a servant. Well, maybe it's just over there. Servant, go look for rain clouds. Servant comes back. No rain. Well, that's strange. The whole nation of Israel is gathered there watching him. The entire nation, and also the king that hates him and wants to kill him. It's going to rain. Prays for rain. No rain. All right, I'm going to pray again. God, send the rain. Second time, same thing. Servant comes back, no rain. At this point, I'm saying, all right, we're going to pray one more time. Everybody, every eye closed, every head bowed, and then I'm like, whoop, like I'm out of there. Like nobody's going to see me again. Thirty times, four times, five times, six times, God, you said that you were going to send rain, so God, send the rain. It wasn't my idea. This was your will, God. You commanded me to do this. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to keep petitioning you. I'm going to keep going after you. Shameless audacity. It is shameless audacity when everybody in the entire nation is watching you pray for rain because you said God said it was going to rain. That took a lot of courage. It took a lot of boldness to keep going after it, to keep believing. The seventh time he prays for rain. It says, rain cloud the size of a man's hand shows up. Not even impressive. If I'd seen that, I would have prayed again. But he's able to see by faith that this is the answer to what it was that God had said. He says, get ready. The storm is coming. Let's get out of here. And then the rain cloud grows and it storms. All that. God answers his prayer. He's faithful. How many of us would have given up after the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, and we never would have seen the rain because we would have stopped petitioning and knocking on that door and asking and seeking like Jesus has told us to. Why did God make Elijah pray seven times? I have no idea. I don't need to know. My only resp- I'm not responsible for understanding everything about God. I'm responsible to be obedient to him. I'm responsible for petitioning him and believing him. And this is why Elijah was able to persist because Elijah had a revelation of, I believe, three things. When he spent those three years in that cave, he was just praying, he was worshiping, he was adoring God, he was listening to God, he was processing through things with God. And after three years of living a life of persistent prayer, of building a relationship with God, he knew that God was good, he knew that God was able, and he knew that God was faithful. The only way that you will know that God is good, he is able and faithful, isn't because some guy from Ann Arbor got up on a stage and told you that. That's not something that any human can convince you of. It's something that only God himself and encounters with the presence of God can convince you of. And the only way that's going to happen is when you become a person of persistent prayer. God, a part of my life is prayer. I'm going to relate to you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to adore you. I'm going to communicate what's on my heart. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to enjoy your presence. And I'm going to keep being shamelessly audacious in petitioning you and asking you for the things that you have revealed to me. The only way you will ever be persistent in your petitioning is when you become persistent in your praying. And I believe that's what God's calling you to this morning. To be someone who's persistent in their prayers. Someone who's persistent in encountering God and building relationship with him. And that will lead you to persistence in petitioning him and never giving up but continuing with bold audacity, with shameless audacity. Keep asking God for all of the things that he said that he was going to do. And as you do that, at just the right time, he's going to answer every one of those prayers. That's the confidence that we have. Would you stand with me this morning? This morning, what you need to know is that you can have boldness in approaching your Heavenly Father. Just like a child approaches their earthly father because of the relationship that you have with him. You were born with the spirit of a slave that made you afraid of God, that made you afraid of his presence, that made it so that by nature you always wanted to remain at arm's length. You didn't want to bother him. But in Romans chapter 8, 
Paul writes that God has caused his own spirit to dwell in us. He says, it's not a spirit of slavery that dwells in you, but it's his spirit that dwells in you. And it's his spirit in us that causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. That means Daddy. It's the most intimate relationship of a child and their father. It's Daddy. It's not that you cause yourself to enter into this kind of relationship. It's the Spirit of God in you that causes you to be transformed and to begin to understand this relationship that you have with God, that he is your daddy. And that's the way that he relates to you. And now because of that, with boldness, you can approach the throne of grace. And he wants you to come. Daddy, you said you were going to do this. Daddy, is today the day? Daddy, will you do it now? And if he says no, or even if he doesn't respond to you at the moment, because you have the spirit of a daughter, the spirit of a son inside of you, you don't question his goodness, you don't question his faithfulness, you don't question his ability, you just come back the next day and you ask for it again. Is today the day? And it might be months, it might be years, it might be decades that you're waiting on it, but you know that your father is good. You know that he is faithful. You know that he is able. And there's a confidence that's born inside of you and knowing that you have everything that you ask for according to his will. So this morning, if you need that, the spirit of God dwelling richly inside of you to cause you to cry out, Abba, Father, to have that kind of relationship that makes it so that you can approach God and petition him with a confidence according to his will. Would you be so bold this morning to raise your hand? God, I need that. I need you to do that inside of me. I can't do it in myself. I need you to cause that kind of relationship this morning. I need that kind of faith in going after you because you've spoken things to my heart. And some of you here this morning, that there are things that you know God spoke to you, but maybe you've given up Maybe you felt like you heard wrong. Maybe you started to question God's goodness and his faithfulness or his ability. This morning, he's calling you to come back before him and to petition him once again. And this time, not to give up, but this time to keep staying strong and going after him for everything that he's put on your heart, according to his will. Jesus, I pray over every hand that was raised this morning. Come and do what only you can do. God, I pray that you would pour out your spirit in this house over every heart, so fully and so richly that it moves from people who just view themselves as servants of the living God, which it is a privilege to be your servant, but it's more than that. We are the sons and the daughters. We are those who have full access to your throne. We are those who have full access to your blessing and to your goodness, not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done, King Jesus. Holy Spirit, cause that to happen in our hearts this morning. And God, I pray for an infusion of faith for every heart that's grown weary, for every heart that's begun to question, for every heart that's given up. Jesus, pour out fresh new faith that's connected to your goodness. And God, I pray that you would do something, that fire would burn inside of this house to be a house of prayer that every one of these people corporately gathering together and praying and seeking after you, relating to you corporately, but also in the prayer closets, in your offices, in the basements, in the bedrooms, wherever you might be, but consistently carving out a place and a time to go after you, Jesus, that relationship would be built, that your presence would be magnified in this place. Change us, God, who we are, and make us like you through persistent prayer. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.